Greetings, everyone. Hope all is doing well. My name is Marcellus Joyner, and I am the chair of RIMCO, a section of the North Carolina Library Association. RIMCO stands for, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, Roundtable for Ethnic and Minority Concerns. I'd like to welcome you to today's workshop, RIMCO and STEM Link. RIMCO and STEM Link presents branching into STEM, expanding retention and improving diversity in STEM librarianships. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Featuring our keynote speaker, Dr. Krista Smith of Western Carolina University. Our distinguished panelists, Denise Lewis from Wake Forest University and Sean Rutherford from Wayne County Public Library. To make your experience better, I'd like to give you a few ways to troubleshoot your mic and video issues. If you're experiencing issues with sound, please try three of the following. Test your speakers by clicking and the down drop menu beside the speaker button. Leave the webinar and come back or try a different browser. If you're still experiencing issues, this webinar is being recorded and will be available before the end of the week. Throughout today's session, session please enter questions into your chat box as you think of them. We'll answer them during the question and answer phase. Thank you all for participating today. Uh, before we begin uh, and open up with our keynote speaker, I would like for the panel to unmute their mics so they can do a brief introduction of themselves. And then we will move into the keynote speaker's presentation. Krista, you can jump right in. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will. Hi, everybody. I am Krista Schmidt, and I am the uh, STEM librarian at Western Carolina University, which is in the mountains here uh, in North Carolina. And uh, I have been out here since 2003, so I'm not even going to do the math for that. Um, my background is an undergraduate um, in biology, and I got my MLS from Chapel Hill. Hi Denise. everyone, my, my name is Denise Lewis. I'm the Research and Instruction Librarian for Engineering and Science at Wake Forest University. Um, I'm the newbie librarian on the panel, um, just got my MLS degree in uh, 2019 and I've been at Wake Forest since 2019. Um, my prior experience um, is in electrical engineering, um, actually worked out in industry in software development, testing, training and support. Um, but this is phase two, librarianship. <laughs> <laughs> And Sean. Hello, I'm Sean Rutherford. I am the uh, teen specialist reference assistant uh, at the Wayne County Public Library in Goldsboro. It's on the eastern part of the state. Um, I've worked in libraries for about five years. Uh, previously, I was in Pennsylvania, uh, Northeast Pennsylvania, up until 2019. I don't have my MLS yet, but I am working on it right now. Uh, online at uh, UNC Greensboro. All right. Thank you all for your introductions. And now we will turn the floor over to Krista Smith. All right. Let me try this, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. Um, well, here we go. All right, hopefully you all can, can see my um, first slide that just says STEM with Krista. If not, I'm sure someone will give me a shout out. So uh, let me start just by saying that, you know, I am Krista Schmidt again, and I am a research and instruction librarian at Western. And I was asked to talk about the idea of STEM, what it is, what it means as a precursor to the panel. So today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of STEM itself, and then in keeping with the idea of STEM diversity today, uh, we're going to take a look at some STEM statistics in the United States as they relate to jobs and higher ed and diversity. Uh, so before we get started, though, I do want to acknowledge that the statistics that I'm using today are coming from governmental agencies. And 
those statistics are often rigid in their data collection and reporting. So for an example, um, there are two categories for a respondent's um, gender or sex, just two. And um, there are often large and sometimes combined categories for ethnicity and race. And I know that there's more nuance than these numbers show. And I know that the reality of the correspondence um, is much more complex than these areas show uh, in the reporting. So I just wanted to let you know what you are going to be seeing today because I am using the reporting from these government entities and I want to make sure I acknowledge the shortcomings before we get started. So what is STEM? So STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it is used when we refer to careers or educational curriculums, generally speaking, that address or integrate these discipline, disciplines. Excuse me. And it's often sh a shorthand or shortcut when we talk about these things altogether. And that's beyond, of course, curriculums or careers. We talk about STEM collections and, or STEM collections and library um, and STEM librarians. So STEM was coined in 2001 by Dr. Judith Ramillay, and she worked at the National Science Foundation during that time. But actually the concept of STEM, combining those areas together, thinking about them conceptually together was around well before that. And it was actually referred to by the National Science Foundation as SMET, or for a little bit of time, METS. But Dr. Ramley suggested changing this concept um, to STEM because in her words, science and math um, support the other two disciplines and because STEM sounds nicer than SMET. And that point is not hard to argue. So that's the acronym that arose and that has flourished since 2001. And it really gained steam in about 2005 to 2010. And now STEM is ubiquitous. So now that we know what the acronym STEM stands for, what is it beyond that? How do we define it? What disciplines does it include? And um, it turns out that STEM is a moving target because what comprises science, technology, engineering, and math isn't always defined the same way by different groups. And sometimes it's not defined at all. So if you go out on the web, and you look at different organizations, government entities, academic institutions, you will find anything from STEM as simply as acronym and no more detail than that. Or sometimes you find that um, somebody has included a conceptual definition along with a list of relevant or included disciplines. So basically there's not a single definition on which everyone relies or agrees. There is an exception though. Uh, while no one quite agrees on the boundaries of STEM, there is actual agreement on the core disciplines included in STEM. So at a minimum, STEM includes, for science, the physical and life sciences with the examples you can see here. Technology is generally computer science. Uh, engineering, all the engineering types, so me mechanical, civil, civil, nuclear, mathematics, basic and applied mathematics. Um, and so these are the disciplines that make up the foundation of STEM. And I think these are likely the disciplines that most of us think of um, as STEM when we are referring to STEM in some way. So while you find that the core is in agreement, where things start to change um, is in the additional disciplines that some entities choose to include when reporting um, or information gathering on STEM. So for example, the National Science Foundation, which is a major funder of STEM research, routinely includes behavioral and social sciences. And so for them, that's disciplines like psychology, sociology, political science, economics. Um, and sometimes they include medicine in their reporting on STEM. The Department of Ed and the Bureau of Labor Statistics sometimes include behavioral and social sciences in their reporting on STEM as well, but not consistently, not consistently like the National Science Foundation. So you can see just from these examples, there's a lot of variability among and within organizations as to what counts as STEM. So STEM is very much a concept lacking concrete boundaries and it does have a core, but I doubt that there's ever going to be consensus in the United States on on STEM 
and what to include versus what to exclude beyond that core, there's no STEM governing body and there is definitely no STEM enforcement. So this is kind of the end of the introduction to STEM as an, as an idea, as a concept. We have a core, it includes all of the science science parts, and then we have some other disciplines that are sometimes included, which is, of course, very clear. Um, and I know that this introduction makes STEM seem a little wiggly and a little mushy, and that many folks would prefer absolutes when it comes to knowing or understanding a concept like STEM, and I get that. I totally get that. It's just we don't have that. Um, so what we do have or what we can take away from today is um, an understanding that when we encounter STEM information, we know that it's variable and sometimes widely variable in what it might include when it is reported or discussed. Uh, for example, if we see STEM statistics in the newspaper and they don't correspond with one another um, day to day or from newspaper to newspaper, we realize that this is probably because they're using um, information resources that define STEM differently. Or we read STEM reports that seem to contradict each other on certain points, um, or even, you know, because of the same reason, they're using different um, data sources. Or people may say, you have too many STEM resources, you don't have enough STEM resources because it, they're coming from different places of understanding what STEM is. So I think what we can bring to this conversation is an understanding that everyone may be talking about slightly different to very different things when they are talking about STEM. And if we understand and accept that the concept of STEM is very flexible and we recognize what STEM means in our one particular community, particularly how our community defines it and how that might be very different from another community, I think we'll be more effective in addressing STEM needs for ourselves and our patrons. And I think that's the key to understanding STEM, this variability, the flexibility, and there's, there's context and nuance that has to be investigated to be fully understood. All right. And excuse me for a minute. I think many of you know it's allergy season. So not what I would choose to do, but there we have it. So let's move forward and talking about uh, and talk about um, some descriptive statistics about STEM that I think are going to be useful when we think about its importance for libraries. And these statistics deal with jobs and education. So we're going to start with looking at statistics for STEM occupations. And then we're going to look at some statistics for education. And these are big picture descriptive stats and they provide us with some context around STEM itself, but also they're going to provide us with some useful information regarding diversity that I think will play into um, some things that we talk about later during the panel. So the first thing we're going to do is look at current employment and projected employment for STEM occupations from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And in fact, um, all the workforce statistics today that I am using are coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but they are not the only um, entity that puts out information like this, just so you know. And for the data today that we're looking at, the Bureau of Labor Statistics defines STEM workers as those workers engaging in occupations that require a post-secondary degree in a STEM field. So they're looking at professional jobs where you have to have that STEM degree. So according to um, the BLS, currently we have 9.96 million working adults in STEM occupations. Um, and that is about 6.5% of the entire occupational workforce as reported here. And you can see those numbers. Um, and so it's a small slice, really, 6.5% doesn't seem like a lot. But if you looked at, at the projected change for 2019 to 2029, you see that that's going to grow by 8%, um, which is double non-STEM occupations and double the average for all occupations together. And so that's one of the reasons STEM education is a huge topic of conversation, because we need people with these post-secondary STEM degrees to fill these roles. All right, so we know that STEM occupations are small but growing sector. Um, so let's take a look at how diversity is stacking up in these occupations. All right, so we're gonna start um, by looking at gender and sex diversity. And if we look at the current STEM workforce, uh, you can see that just by looking that the proportions between women and men in STEM areas that are reported by the BLS, and in this case, they're putting computer and math together, 
we have architecture and engineering, and then we have life physical, and in this instance, the social sciences. So our last set, the overall workforce, didn't include social sciences, but this does. And we can see that there are disparities in these workforces between the sexes, with men overwhelmingly making up numbers of the STEM workforce in computers and math, and architecture and engineering, with more equity um, in the life, physical, and social sciences. However, if you take out that social sciences part, that, number, that pie chart would probably look um, at least a little different. So you might say, okay, Krista, but maybe this is progress. Maybe we've come a long way in the last 10 years. So let's take a look at that. And what you see here um, is a historic comparison of these um, same metrics for STEM workers from 2010. The small pie chart is showing the 2010 data. Um, and as you can see, not much has changed. Um, there is a noticeable uptick in the life, physical, and social sciences from 2010 to 2020, but it's not that great. And there is a little improvement in architecture and engineering, but it's minuscule. And actually, computer and math has gotten worse since 2010. So STEM diversity has some big disparities when we look at it by sex, gender. Just this brief, big, broad overview. Um, what about if we look at the STEM workforce through the lens of race and ethnicity? Also, are there imbalances and disparities when we look at diversity in the STEM workforce in this way? So uh, what we see here is pretty evident at first glance. Um, there are large disparities between the BLS provided divisions of race and ethnicity. So they use four in their reporting. Asian, Black or African-American, Hispanic or Latino, and white, as you can see here. And um, within each of those are those three different um, occupational areas in STEM that we saw earlier. And you can see that there are just wide gaps and very deep disparities between those um, ethnic and race racial groups that the BLS is using. But also there's a lot of disparity between um, disciplines with some doing better <laughs> um, with diversity and some showing um, a lot more disparity between um, groups depending on the STEM occupation. So as with the gender sex lens, is this a better picture than 10 years ago or not? And have we made any progress? So the reality is, if you look at this, you think this does not look much different. And the answer is, it's a little different because the numbers have grown overall, but the disparity between individuals who identify as Asian, Black or African-American, Hispanic or Latino, and white is still very evident. Um, if you look back at the 2020 data, which I'm not gonna go back and forth um, right now, you'll see that certain disciplines employ um, more people from underrepresented populations now than they did in 2010. So for example, in 2010, individuals who identified as Asian held, as you can see here, just over 500,000 jobs. Um, in 2020, that is well over a million. Um, and computer science is one area um, in 2020 where there were lots of gains across um, all of those uh, different ethnicities and races. So um, those are good gains, but proportionally speaking, that disparity, that divide is still there in STEM occupational workforce. So what do we know? What are our takeaways? Well, our takeaways are that STEM, we know STEM occupations are going to require um, more workers there because it's increasing, that demand is increasing. Um, and we know that there hasn't been significant progress in increasing diversity by either sex or gender or race ethnicity. And that large gaps between these groups of workers remain. So the question then arises to at least me, will these disparities improve significantly? And if so, when and how? And I think one way to look at the previous question of when and how STEM workforce force, excuse me, diversity might improve, is to look at STEM education, particularly post-secondary education, to see who's graduating with STEM degrees and what kind of diversity do we see in those new workers? Is that going to address some of the disparities that we're seeing 
in the occupational workforce. So we're going to take a look at some National Center for Education Statistics information for this next part, and it's the final part with statistics, I promise. Um, and these statistics, unlike the BLS statistics, these all use the core science um, disciplines that we talked about earlier. So we do not have any um, behavioral or social sciences included here. All right, so let's give a little context again. Um, here's post-secondary education overall. And in this case, it's limited to bachelor, master, and doctoral. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, associates is not included here. And right now we have about 3 million people per year graduating with these post-secondary degrees. So of these, how many are STEM degrees? So you can see that STEM um, for bachelor's degrees is about 20.5% for the most recent year reported, um, almost 17% for master's degrees and about 16% for doctoral degrees. And these, have all, these are all up from a decade ago, um, some significantly like master's degree, uh, which is up 11.7%. So that's, that's really an interesting um, evolution of how STEM degrees uh, have grown since the last decade. Um, so, all right, we know what percentage they make up. What about diversity? What does that look like with our STEM graduates? What does it look like with our regular graduates, all discipline graduates? So let's take a look at both gender and sex diversity, as well as um, race and ethnic diversity in STEM higher ed graduates. And this will be for the current year. All right. In all of higher education, if we look at this by sex, we see that women make up well over 50% of those getting degrees. And actually it averages out to just about 57%, I think when you take all those together. Um, but you can see that for master's degrees, women make up almost 61% of the total graduates. What does STEM look like? Uh, <laughs> STEM does not look great. Um, when we look at this in STEM fields, we see that the number falls precipitously um, with only a little over a third of STEM graduates identifying as women. So we can see the STEM diversity disparity in education exists when we look at gender sex. And you can maybe think about what that means our workforce is going to look like and how that might change or not our current occupational diversity when it comes to gender or sex. All right, so this is not great um, as far as diversity goes for uh, women. Let's take a look at race and ethnicity. Are these numbers also indicating large gaps? Okay, I know this is a lot, um, but what you have are the what we have here are the three levels for bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees, and um, all disciplines are on the. This is left and STEM disciplines are on the right. And you can see based on the shading, we have different races and ethnicities. So if you look at the um, race ethnicity breakdowns in each degree category with um, what we have here, what you find is that both bachelor's and master's degrees, the STEM disciplines really reflect very closely what diversity we're seeing in all disciplines. Um, doctoral degrees are slightly different for STEM disciplines with higher percentage of individuals identifying as white obtaining those degrees as compared with those in all disciplines. So we're seeing these disparities definitely exist, but kind of unlike the um, gender and sex, we see that uh, the race ethnicity disparities are not just a STEM problem. They are a higher ed problem. All right, um, so some final thoughts. I know this has been a whirlwind, um, so I hope it's been helpful to understand that STEM is a malleable concept. It does have some core disciplines attached to it, um, and that it's important to sort of investigate when you see STEM information, what those boundaries are that are in play at that time. I also hope that um, seeing glimpses of diversity issues, and I know that we didn't get into some of the deeper issues that really, really deserve a lot more time for discussion. In STEM jobs and in STEM higher ed is beneficial. Um, when we look at diversity in other areas that STEM influences, such as our libraries, our librarians, and um, our patron needs. 
So thank you for um, your time today for this introduction and I will mute myself now so that the panel can move forward. Thank you, Krista, for uh, giving us an overview of STEM. Uh, that was a big eye opener for me, uh, especially with the, the statistics. Um, STEM is um, kind of a, a new concept for me, uh, especially within the last 10 to 15 years, like really just hearing the phrase itself. But um, I'm, I'm starting to get a growing understanding of it. And we're now we're gonna open up the panel so the panel can discuss uh, uh, their um, experiences with STEM and, and um, if you could, uh, if you guys, if the panel can unmute their, the microphones. We're gonna get started with the first question. Uh, when you describe what you do to your peers and colleagues, how do they react as related to STEM? Are you, so I thought about this. So my non-librarian colleagues don't uh, always know what librarians do in general, <laughs> other than buy books or maybe answer questions. Um, so I, I think they're kind of interested in a vague way, but as soon as I see them, you know, going up beyond, if I go beyond any more of some of the in-depth details, there's like some glassy eyed <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've described um, exactly what I do um, because some people have never been to libraries. I didn't grow up in a library, so I didn't really know what they did before I got into it. And so even me walking into one and seeing, oh, they have computers here. <laughs> and that's usually the uh, reaction I get from people who aren't sure like they don't know how many people actually work in a library what it takes to run it all the things you have to think about all the things you have to do i know that as i've started getting into program planning that's been a big change for me and especially getting into stem how much you have to schedule and plan and what you have to think about and the diversity of things you have to know is uh, really the big thing where uh, you're basically a jack of all trades because you have to be. Yeah, I share both Sean and Krista's um, remarks in that it just depends on who I'm talking to. Because um, even talking to, you know, fellow librarian colleagues, um, especially about what I do um, with, um, with engineering, um, sometimes the eyes may glaze over. Um, if I'm talking to, you know, friends from um, you know, from when I was at Georgia Tech, you know, they're more like, okay, I need you to do this research for me. <laughs> so, so it just varies. All right. How do you keep up with trends in STEM? Um, I really love um, ASEE, the American Society for Engineering Education actually sends out a newsletter um, each day of the week, which actually is really good with regards to um, giving you a, a slice of what's going on with research, what's going on um, in terms of policy with different legislative decisions, um, as well as what's happening in industry. Um, and then there are people that I follow on LinkedIn um, just to see, you know, what they're sharing. Um, and that's more of a different slice where um, I have friends that are involved with engineering education, um, you know, back from, you know, Georgia Tech. So they usually give me the information in terms of what's going on with STEM education. So um, it's a different slice. I would say that um, I pay attention to popular news sources, social media, um, some listservs, uh, man, going into Scientific American and some of those um, 
popular magazines can really show you some of the trends without having to get uh, kind of waylaid sometimes by the jargon and the technical things. But I should say that I think it's kind of an impossible task to keep up with every trend. And I think most of us know that you just, you just can't. And so I try not to beat myself up too much. Um, when someone mentions something that I haven't heard of before, then I immediately go look at it. Um, and hopefully that doesn't happen too often, but, you know, I think talking to other librarians particularly, and um, I'm on an engineering listserv that's really useful because that's an area with which I am probably the least familiar. familiar. Um, and I, I, I find that sort of thing useful for just seeing what else is going on. Yeah, I, uh, I will say I'm not as science-y oriented. Growing up, I did like science, but I ended up going in more of the social science and business route. So I've had to step back into that sort of world. So there are some colleagues that are into STEM uh, that I ask. Uh, there are some uh, various programming websites that I tend to frequent and blogs that I keep up with. I will agree, uh, Krista, with the Scientific American, Smithsonian, things like that, that have uh, certain things like that. And I really love um, some YouTube uh, affiliations of big net, big networks like CNBC, uh, different things like that. Cheddar, they have a lot of cool, like short uh, stuff that shows kind of what's popular as far as STEM trends, uh, things like that. So if it's easily digestible, it sort of gets me into it. And then I go on from there. Uh, but as far as the jargon, I'm not into the world enough uh, of STEM engineering, things like that to sort of go into that. And since my primary world is um, teaching it to teens, getting teens involved, uh, the starting out sort of how I am uh, is really important to me. What associations and conferences should interested, uh, people interested in STEM um, be attending? So when I started out, um, I went to the Special Libraries Association uh, conference, and I found a lot more um, science-focused topics there uh, than I had at other conferences. So I thought that was a really good one uh, because it did speak to that specific, STEM-specific stuff in, in ways that other conferences haven't. Um, Stella Unconference is a great one. I've attended that before. And uh, I attended that when it was in North Carolina. So that's a good one. Um, I like to rotate conferences because I find that going to conferences year after year, uh, you sometimes get the same, it feels the same. And so giving yourself a break from any particular conference can be useful. And of course, as a um, academic librarian, uh, ACRL, but obviously STEM link, if you're going to join an association, that is a good one to join. Most definitely. Yeah, so thus far I've gone to um, ASEE's national conference um, when they had it in Tampa as well as virtual. And I like that conference because it covers both the technical and they also have an engineering librarian division that I'm a part of um, and active with. And then, um, the science boot camps that was mentioned. Um, there are different regions that have their own science boot camps. Um, I was lucky enough to go to the Southeast Regional um, Boot Camp in 2019 when it was held at Vanderbilt. And those topics vary. Um, and then I attended one online last year. Um, LOEX is also another option. Um, and then um, SLA definitely has um, HamNet, which is the Physics, Ast um, Astronomy, and Mathematics Organization for Librarians, has a really strong um, presence within SLA. All right. Uh, Krista, you brought up some um, very uh, 
detailed information about diversity uh, within STEM. Let me pose this question to the, the, uh, the panel. What are your thoughts on diversity in STEM librarianship? What are some ways that we can improve this area of, of librarianship? Um, well, one thing we can do to sort of kick off this part is to look at some statistics that uh, I compiled for the panelists to look at. And did we lose Sean? I don't see him. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so, uh, Denise, if that's okay with you, shall I go ahead and pull those up? Oh, of course. Definitely, okay. Krista. Okay. Um, let me... Uh, share my well of course this takes more time than one would wish got to switch over from one set of slides to the other all right and we're going to share this so um just so you can see this is the library science master's degree just statistical overview very fancy let me look over here. Um, and so uh, we discussed this a little bit, the panelists beforehand, and this is an overview of just the total number of library science graduates for selected years. So you can see it's been up and down and we're kind of on a little bit of an upswing um, for these past two years. For some reason, I cannot see how to advance my slide. Um, and for the most recent year, here's the library of science degree by sex. So this is almost an inversion of some of what we saw earlier as far as who's getting degrees. Um, and this also came from the National Center for Education Statistics. And then um, these are the library of science degrees by race and ethnicity. And this is a comparison from 2008 to 2009 um, with 2018-2019. So I think that can tell some of the story too of what we're seeing um, in the profession regarding diversity, how many, how many graduates we're seeing. All right. Oh, hold on, let me make sure there's not another, nope, that's the last slide. Um, I will stop sharing that now somehow when I can find the share screen option. I got it. Oh, you got it, great, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> yeah. it. I disappeared. <laughs> Technology is wonderful. <laughs> um, Denise, did you, um, did you have anything to add for that question? Marcellus, give me that question one more time because I just had a brain freeze. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on diversity in STEM librarianship and what are some ways we can improve this area of librarianship? Yeah, because I think right now, when I think about my, you know, um, where I work, conferences that I've been to and different events involving in STEM, um, you in terms of librarianship, you typically see um, more Caucasian females. Um, then if you look in terms of, you know, overall race and ethnicity, um, and you don't see as many BIPOC representatives, but there are different ways that we can go about um, addressing, increasing um, diversity and STEM librarianship. Um, it could be a, a you know, a, an approach in terms of increasing programming in the K through 12 level um, so that people can see diverse um, STEM librarians. Um, it could even move toward um, higher ed with regards to um, going to um, some of those historically um, uh, black uh, colleges and universities and recruiting there. Even some of the, um, the Hispanic um, and Latin colleges and universities um, but basically, you know, making a concerted effort, but it's going to take a programmatic effort because you can see from the numbers um, from just STEM to librarianship, when you combine both, 
you're really looking at a small populace. So how can we grow that um, at all levels? Uh, and I, I think we have Sean back. Mm -hmm. My <laughs> Wi-Fi right. completely went out for a second. Okay, um, I'll, I'll reread the question. Um, I think you just um, missed uh, Krista and Denise's response to it, but the question was, what are your thoughts on diversity in STEM librarianship? And what are some ways that we can improve uh, the area of librarianship? I think uh, I've been watching a couple things on this um, that uh, I might as well, as I get my thoughts together. Um, as uh, you have a lot of males that are uh, attracted to STEM dominated fields. So like uh, you see a lot of them in engineering as we saw with the statistics. Yet in education, librarianship is a female dominated field. So you may not have females wanting to go into STEM professions just because they feel intimidated. And you may have males not wanting to go into education and librarianship because they either feel intimidated or some sort of that it's beneath them, whatever uh, that they might have. Um, so I think there's just some sort of uh, misunderstanding in that cross because I certainly never thought that I was going to be a librarian. And I think within my background, it just wasn't presented to me as a field. If I wanted to go and be an engineer or a mathematician or a scientist, I would just go right ahead. They, I didn't have anyone telling me I couldn't, even though I didn't really want to. And I enjoyed this job a lot better than I would as like a chemical engineer or something. Um, so I think just changing the uh, way we approach um, kids and teens to say, hey, if you like it, you can do it. It doesn't really matter uh, what anyone says you can or can't do because everything is up here. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna piggyback off of the statements you guys just, just added and um, you know, um, one thing I was thinking about, and, and and this may be a suggestion, I don't know if someone's already doing this, but there are, I'm pretty sure there are already programs, math science programs that, are, that predate uh, the trending of STEM. Uh, I was a part of um, MSCN um, here in North Carolina, um, math science and enrichment program. As a matter of fact, I was, uh, part of the inaugural class in, uh, in my seventh grade class. And that, that um, program still exists today. So it, you know, it could also be that there is, um, needs to be a connection between those who are actually pushing the STEM initiative, uh, reaching out to program, pre-existing programs that deal with both math, science, and enrichment, uh, and making that connection. Um, and with that, being said, we're gonna move into our next question. How would you describe the retention of underrepresented populations in STEM librarianship? So um, I will take a try at answering this. Um, so I was looking around to see what kind of scholarly work has been done on um, retention within STEM librarians. And there's really, there's not much. So um, I think uh, if you want to look at retention of underrepresented populations that you really have to um, look at the literature in general related to retention of whichever underrepresented population that you might um, be interested in. So if we're talking about race and ethnicity, um, of course, it's not my place as a white heterosexual woman to talk about what I think the barriers are, but there's some good literature out there that can educate people like myself as to what, particularly when it comes to race and ethnicity, but also for people who may belong to the um, LGBTQIA community who are also not well represented um, in librarianship necessarily. You know, we can, that's a place for us to start reading and understanding what our colleagues um, are struggling with and how they're, even if it's a similar 
type of barrier that the barrier is actually very different for people who are from underrepresented populations than they are for people, you know, just like me. So um, I am going to leave it at that. Um, if you want, there is a, an article by Trevor Riley Reed. It's a short read um, that was quite interesting um, for those of us who aren't clear as to what some of those barriers might be for retention. Anyone else want to add? I can't really add that much because I'm, I'm new to the field of librarianship in general, but there was um, one really good article I read and I have to apologize because I um, forget both the title as well as um, the authors, um, but it spoke to um, some of the barriers that um, uh, underrepresented um, minorities face in librarianship, um, especially with STEM librarianship. Um, and some of it tied into you um, with always being looked at in regards to for diversity or DEI initiatives. Um, so spending more time on committee work rather than on research um, for those librarians who are more tenure tracked. Um, uh, there is a sense of isolation in terms of, you know, being the only um, in your, you know, area, um, maybe your library. Uh, but those were two of the highlights that I saw in that article, and there were about three other topics um, mentioned. Um, but retention, it all plays a part in, you know, are individuals growing? Do they have the same um, opportunities with regards to, um, depending on where they are, are you an academic STEM librarian, are you a public librarian, programmatic focused STEM librarian, or are you um, a school media specialist? But it's... Um, uh, ensuring that you have the support, mentorship, as well as um, continuing education, um, and that you're not being pulled into a variety of different ways in terms of being the face of diversity, um, as well as you know, doing your day job and then yourself possibly turning around and mentoring others. I just have one thing to add. Um... In a little bit of research, I had stumbled upon this TED talk that was given a few years ago. Um, it was a uh, by a doctorate in or a black woman who had earned her doctorate in mathematics, and she's really involved in uh, researching how we get people involved in STEM education as educators. I don't remember her name. Uh, her first name was Ronnie, but I don't remember her last name. Um, what she had said was uh, for recruitment and retention, a big thing is changing the mindset of the actual educators that are going in. Um, it can be the same with teachers and librarians that it's really a calling rather than a job. You're not going there to make money, certainly. Uh, you're doing it for a reason and to help them realize that they are agents of change in other people's lives. So how she put it was she was from uh, a high school in um, Washington, DC that didn't have a lot of resources that was, she was never told that she could become uh, something in a STEM field um, of any sort, but she had this teacher that was an agent of change in her life that said, you can do anything. And if you uh, change the attitude of teachers uh, and have those that really want to make a difference and encourage them uh, to think that way, that they can make a difference in whoever they're teaching, uh, then you might be able to uh, impact underrepresented populations in that way. I believe um, it definitely has to be a, um, a community effort, so to speak, to really push that initiative. And not only that, um, they, they have all the opportunity to show the diversity of, of the different ways you can go in STEM. I think Krista hit on um, something that I was unaware of, that there, um, that there is STEM in social science. Was that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, social sciences, psychology in particular is mentioned as one of the STEM. Yeah, so I, I think the, the key is not only uh, pushing that uh, agenda as, as Sean 
was saying, but also showing the diversity of areas in which you can, you can filter into through STEM, uh, which leads up to our next question. Uh, what underrepresented population is the most, let me make sure I'm reading this right. What underrepresented population is most represented in STEM and why do you believe that is? In STEM librarianship or in STEM? Um, if we if we had to refer to your statistic, your statistics, your statistics were um, overall, right? Well, I mean, the library there was the MLS degrees, although that doesn't really um, show how many people are are working in the because people do leave. We have attrition. We know that. Okay. Um, the profession. Probably, I would say. I don't know. I'm, I'm so hesitant to make us, I misread that question earlier for some reason. Um, I'm hesitant to, to guess. Anybody else want to take a stab? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the, the research on that, it varies. If you just look at STEM in general um, from the numbers, um, uh, you know, it, it would seem as if it's either, you know, um, Hispanic, Latinx, um, or Asian Americans. Um, if you look at STEM librarianship, um, there aren't really any numbers out there. Um, if I was to take a guess, and I'm truly saying this is a guess. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when I think about who I've seen at different conferences, so if I go to ASEE and if I go to um, the Southeast Science Bootcamp, um, I've seen more um, Hispanic, Latinx um, librarians represented there. Um, but that's from my singular experience, um, you know, looking at those specific events. Um, but they're just in researching, there isn't. Um, I wasn't able to find a singular instance, um, you know, really breaking down um, STEM librarianship with regards to diversity. Um, there are articles that speak about it, but not necessarily, you know, really conclusive in terms of, you know, definitive statistics. And I will also add in, if I may, that STEM librarianship in academics, because that's what I know, it varies from people like me. I work at a regional comprehensive university and I am the STEM librarian, but at NC State, um, there are many librarians and they don't do everything that I do. So you might have some STEM librarians who are just instruction and research, and then you have other STEM librarians who might be collection development librarians for STEM specifically. Um, and then you have people who look, work at very small institutions who they're not only the STEM librarian, but they're also <laughs> in reference, but they're also the catalogers and, you know, they're the CERC folks and they're STEM and humanities. And so I think that would be kind of a very hard population in some ways to nail down, Denise, the STEM librarians, even if we just limited to that in academics, like, as I said on my talk, who, who is that exactly, you know, and, and do you consider yourself a STEM librarian? Because, because I think sadly, probably some people who are STEM librarians might not consider themselves that. And, you know, that would be a shame to miss those folks um, to kind of see. But I agree, I couldn't, I could not find anything that spelled that out in any way. Or they may, well, yeah, uh, to piggyback on what you just said, um, they may not even realize that they're a STEM librarian, uh, especially if they're a social science library. <laughs> like, you know, I, I had no idea that STEM had a avenue in that area. All right. Um, do you believe STEM isn't well explored by underrepresented populations uh, today because it wasn't well represented in secondary or post-secondary education back in the early mid 2000s?
Mm. I need to keep talking first, so um, <laughs> but I'm going to. <laughs> I, mean, I can't stand the awkward silence. I'm sorry. I want to speak about the awkward silence. It gets me. Except with, I, can, I can wait them out. Um, so I think that there are still some infrastructures and institutional racism for those who might belong to um, her, an underrepresented ethnic or racial group, but also institutional bias against other, you know, underrepresented groups too, that are in some ways, maybe in my opinion only, feeding um, into the reason that STEM remains a low um, discipline for diversity. As far as uh, secondary education, uh, I know that when I was in school, which wasn't too long ago, hopefully, uh, in the late 2000s, um, I know there wasn't a, uh, and I went to a fairly diverse school, but there was not really a push for diversity in segments. It was more of a broad uh, and this is just what I observed, um, a we don't see color sort of thing and come if you want merit based. And it wasn't really speaking to any particular group, which can sometimes mean you're only speaking to one group, depending on who is relaying the message. And I think it is a little bit that way today, even though we've gotten a little bit better about segmenting, understanding people's needs um, to, based on diversity, things like that. But if we are to increase diversity, like uh, we had said before, um, it needs to come from the right person in the right circumstance. So there are a lot of people who, if I say, get involved in STEM and all this stuff, it doesn't really matter what the content is. Uh, if I'm saying it, I could speak to a certain number of people, but I'm not going to reach everyone. So sort of diversity causes diversity and you kind of have to have get that snowball rolling as we were talking about before and changing attitudes. And back then in secondary and post-secondary, it wasn't getting the snowball rolling as much until maybe in the last decade. Okay. Well, let's- my brain uh, is- Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Denise, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just gonna say my brain's going in so many different directions because I think one of the things that we can recognize just from this past year um, is that there's you know systematic racism um, that exists on a variety of different levels. Um, and I remember helping a student, you know, just last week um, with regards to COVID research um, and health equity. Um, and it's really eye-opening to see, you know, different examples of where um, that exists. Um, so it, you have to look at it as at a, a framework is that there isn't really a concerted effort um, from all different levels. Um, in terms of, you know, there's the grassroots efforts that really help um, from, you know, individuals going to different, you know, elementary, middle school, high schools um, to try to get kids interested in STEM. Um, but then if you're interested in STEM and you're from an unrepresented populace and you may not necessarily have the funding to go to college, then it's a matter of, you know, finding that avenue of, um, you know, how do you afford to get to college? And then when you're there, um, how do you afford to stay? Um, and then after graduation, understanding, you know, what opportunities exist in the field. Um, because companies do have sort of kind of um, tiers or niches that they look at. Um, I remember when I worked for Intel, um, I went to recruit um, at the um, Mesby National Society of Black Engineers Conference. Um, that's where I started to understand that there were certain schools that, um, 
were recruited at that were considered tier one. Um, and even if a student had a, you know, graduated with an engineering degree necessarily from a tier two school, they were only looked at um, as, you know, possibilities for fab technicians versus um, actually engineers within the fab and without and outside of it. So it, until those grassroots efforts become more long-term where you have those underrepresented minorities becoming not so underrepresented um, and pulling back and, you know, grabbing someone and pulling them in. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty hard. Um, Cause you know, it's easy to, I just think of my own um, journey and I've had mentors every step along the way. Um, you know, when I was pursuing, you know, engineering, um, from, you know, Dr. George Faison when I was in middle school to when I was at Georgia Tech, um, professors. But, you know, one of the things that I didn't realize is that Georgia Tech actually grad is one of, you know, typically fights neck and neck with North Carolina a and in terms of the number of um, African-American graduates for bachelor's in engineering. Um, so I didn't realize that my experience was more sort of positive than me say, you know, someone who majored in engineering at another college university. Um, so it's, it's, it's a variety of different um, variables, not necessarily attributed to one. Um. And, I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned um, different variables playing into it. Uh, in, and this is just my, my, my thinking that, you know, not only do you have the, the biases that may be holding, um, holding um, back the diversity piece, but, and, and I, I could pose this question to the, the panel. Do you also think that is because STEM is still developing its, um, its pathway in American education? Um, do you think it's, it's, it's still kind of forming and shaping its own, own path and that may be playing into it as well, kind of a double-edged sword, so to speak? Yeah, just as far as uh, what I've been looking at. Um, so take, for example, uh, how I like looking at some certain CNBC videos, they have little documentaries. Um, there was a video that I was watching this morning, actually, that was describing how China uh, had committed over 10 years ago to becoming the leader in electric cars. In 2009, I don't think a lot of people were really, even in STEM fields, were thinking a lot about electric cars, but now it is all the rage and we feel like we have to catch up immediately. And I don't think even 10 years ago, there were a lot of coders or um, programmers. So I think it is developing, but it's developing in, at such a fast rate that the speed at which you have to learn it and then learn something else and learn something else in order to keep up uh, may be a little daunting, uh, even for people in the field. All right. Um, well, let's, let's, let's talk about, um, unless anybody else wanted to add anything to that question or that statement, um, let's, let's move on to retention. Uh, let me pose this question to you, you, you guys. Um, what are some retention barriers that STEM librarians um, may face? I think the rapid evolution um, in the field is one. Um, and then also the fact that uh, you don't have some of the same um, like I think about taxonomy, you know, as a librarians, when we're doing, you know, we're searching for a particular term. Um, it, in the sciences, there are cer certain terminology that, you know, state the same over time, but in other areas, it varies. Like, I remember doing some research for one instructor who was interested in biomimetics, um, but in reviewing the literature, it could be referred to as biomimetics, um, uh, biomimicry, or bio-inspired. So, that's one of the difficulties in being a STEM librarian is you don't have that consistent terminology or 
or taxonomy unless you're looking at a specific database like PubMed with MeSH subject terms. Um, and there really isn't a singular source for all of the research within STEM. So you end up having to keep up with a variety of different um, interfaces that um, in and of themselves, you actually search the, the information in a different way. Um, can't use Boolean logic terms in all um, databases, <laughs> which is weird. <laughs> or you get, you know, like IEEE Explore where you can use Boolean logic, you can use near. <laughs> so it's, it's um, dealing with a complex field using a variety of different um, resources to keep up with that resource. And then, you know, realizing that, you know, um, trying to find certain resources, you have to be very inventive and creative to do so. Yep. I would say, um, to build on some of the specific things, like <laughs> something that's very also, and Denise, you sort of, this is building on something you said, our, our resources are expensive and that comes from books to video. I mean, they are some of the most expensive resources that libraries spend money on are these different sources. And so you can't have all of them and you have to choose and it can become very demoralizing, um, you know, for libraries of a certain size. Uh, when I know we had some growing pains when we reached an FTE threshold for that's full-time equivalent for the number of students and you get a different pricing tier and then you cannot start to afford things. And so then you have to, there's some tough decision-making um, that goes on and, you know, relaying those messages can be, can be tough. Um, but I also think that a lot of what happens too is um, for retention, just thinking like compensation isn't always that great. Um, you know, lack of professional support. So if you're a STEM library in particular and you, you're newly recruited, you really need to have infrastructure that will provide you with support for professional development so that you feel like you have opportunities to go in and meet people. Because while Zoom is great and I'm glad everybody is here today, um, you know, when we can be together safely, it's, there's nothing like making those connections in person. And we need to make sure that we foster that. And so when that's not fostered, and you have these other barriers like Denise was talking about, it's very easy, I think, to, to lose people. I mean, and we need, we need mentoring um, in STEM. And again, Denise, I'll, people who understand the jargon, people who understand like, oh, well, this isn't, you hear people talk about this, but that's sort of like five years ago. And now here's what we're, what we're doing. And that makes, that makes a big difference because you don't feel like you're always playing catch up with whatever um, new idea or concept is out there. I, I would just probably piggyback on that and say funding. Uh, coming from a small rural library, funding was always an issue. Uh, it's still an issue now. Um, worrying about if budget's gonna be cut because of this or that, something out of your control. Um, just as far as how it's great that a lot of new STEM technologies are coming in as far as what you can get for the library, but a lot of it is quite expensive, especially with uh, 3D printing and the advent of that and that coming in. Um, I would love to delve into that, but just the startup uh, cost for that as a program and the learning curve for it and wondering if it's a good investment uh, with the time and research it takes, uh, that is probably the most demoralizing thing that I've encountered. For someone who lacks experience in the field, uh, but shows interest, how would you encourage them to better, better their skills and, and knowledge in, in the area of STEM? Well, or shall I say, um, you know, someone, this is um, something new to them and they find some interest in it or they, they find an avenue uh, within STEM that interests them. How, um, how would you um, 
encourage them to to um, gain more knowledge about it and to pursue that path as a so, librarian. Okay, so if someone was interested in, in STEM librarianship, um, um, I definitely you know recommend for them to you know get a mentor in the field. Um, and actually a variety of different mentors from different segments. Um, Cause one of the things that um, Christy alluded to earlier is that you could have, you know, um, a re you know, instruction STEM librarian, a research STEM librarian. Um, there are different, you know, um, people that serve very narrow slices and then there are those, you know, who do everything underneath the sun. Um, and then also I would say to, you know, develop their grit. Um, uh, as well as, you know, to really start um, researching um, a, or a really good book that I recommend them that seems to have stand, stood the test of time is Library Research Methods by Thomas Mann. Um, but get them to understand that, you know, um, to develop those basics of just doing research and then how it translates into a technical field um, and then have them playing with different interfaces um, if they don't have access, you know, PubMed um, can be researched. Um, and then there's Dimensions, which is another tool. Um, and then there are some open access, you know, directive open access research that um, I would steer them toward. But, you know, just try to encourage them to develop an inquisitive nature um, and then familiarize themselves with different interfaces. Denise, do you mind dropping the title of that book in the um, in the chat? Of course. All right. So I'm going to just add a thing to you here. Um, to me, the lowest barrier for entry when you're interested in something that you don't know much about, if you can get onto a listserv or if you can join an association that has people who are who are regularly talking, um, that's a good way for people who really feel uncertain because it's, it can be completely passive on your part. Um, and a lot of times, so I have an engineering with serve, as I said earlier, you get people throwing out reference questions or you get people who are asking questions about where can I find this thing and, and you get discussions that you don't have to necessarily participate in but you can sort of absorb and see what's going on. And then one thing that we do in our library for all new librarians, and it does have some STEM questions that could probably be developed into something um, that would be useful if you're going to mentor somebody who's interested in STEM, is we uh, compile lists of questions that were actually asked and that we've actually answered and give those to our new librarians and say, have, see if you can do, do this, can you answer this question? And if so, what did you use? Um, and that tends to be a really useful exercise for getting people into, into things rather than just asking them, um, you know, just telling them to go poke around because sometimes poking around doesn't really get you at the same thing as a real question will get you. That sounds super, super easy to answer and is not, it turns out it's not easy to answer. So those are those would be my suggestions for people who are interested. Okay. As someone who fits the mold of the uh, question, I'm writing things down. <laughs> and uh, uh, as far as what I've learned, because I've really only been in STEM for maybe a year, and uh, what a year it's been <laughs> for for the to be a new entrant in anything. Um, I like the idea of a mentor, um, that is, I'm echoing Denise on that. Um, the mentorship is good. Just finding something concrete. Um, I am a research sort of person. So what I like to do is what interests me, write it down, um, get it in words, uh, in concrete form onto a paper. Uh, see where it goes, and then find resources from there. So sort of like poking around, um, especially on YouTube, various videos, just you don't know what you don't know yet, but if you have an interest in it, try to find where that interest is going to snake. And when you follow it, 
um, if it leads to somewhere that's actually concrete, hey, I can actually learn this or get in an education in it, uh, I would do that and doors uh, may open up there uh, if you have a more concrete knowledge of what you want or what you want to do. Yeah. We, are, uh, we are now entering uh, our question answer portion of the presentation. Um, if anyone, any, anyone who's attending has any questions, please uh, put them in the chat and we will present them to the, uh, the panel. Um, and I'll, I'll go ahead and start off the question and answer phase uh, with um, something we were touching on before the presentation started. Um, I was um, asking the panel, had they heard of, um, of STEM referred to as STEAM? And um, from my understanding, what STEAM is, is it is STEM, but there is the A starts, uh, stands for the art piece of it or um, the art avenue uh, of STEM. So it, as, as everyone on the panel has uh, said earlier, um, this is a fast growing, fast growing section um, in, in librarianship. So here you, you have something being added to, added to it, which I, I, I think is excellent because I feel like art has died off as um, something to concentrate on in, in, um, in elementary education. Um, so I, I think it, it would be a, it's a, a um, expansive avenue for, for STEM to, for STEM to, um, to open up. Uh, can uh, the panel um, elaborate on um, their experience or knowledge with STEAM? I can share a personal anecdote of that because when we, you had uh, brought it up before, sort of jogged my memory and I wrote it down. Um, when we first started uh, doing a lot of STEM, STEAM stuff, um, when I got into my position, we started a STEM club, but we made it into a STEAM club instead. Instead, um, There were some kids, um, middle, high school that were coming in. Um, they had some interest in STEM. One of them was an artist and she actually drew a guitar that we cut out of cardboard and did some uh, things to it with like circuit kits and that was fun. Um, and we introduced a spirograph and that was a giant hit. Um, going back to uh, what you had said about the psychology and social sciences, diversity of fields, including art, can definitely pull in people who, I know a lot of artists and people who are creatives that if you say STEM, they run 100 feet, 100 feet in the opposite direction. <laughs> I'm a little bit like that. Um, and having that art tie-in can definitely just get them in and see, hey, STEM may not be college level or boring like you think it is. So that I think STEAM uh, is very important uh, to attracting not only uh, the uh, general population, but a lot of underrepresented groups that may be more attracted to art than STEM in general. Okay. Anyone else? I think STEAM is a good way to get more synergy between people who think that or don't realize that STEM is probably a part of their everyday lives in ways that they just don't think about, like repeating patterns. Um, and there's some great, there's some lovely books I've been trying to make sure that I buy and sometimes our art librarian buys books that sort of cross that. Um, barrier between like math and, and drawing, or um, one of them is like about patterns in nature and how that reflects art. And so I think one of the issues with STEAM though in higher ed, um, and Denise, I don't know if you feel like weighing in on this or not, but um, it takes special people to try to work this, what they see as interdisciplinary. I mean, sometimes there's not even a lot of 
collaboration across the core STEM fields in ways that we'd like to see. And so I think there's a lot of great opportunities, but I think convincing people how those work together is a little harder maybe in the higher ed um, realm at the current moment anyway. Yeah, STEM, STEAM is, is a term you, you'll hear more in the K through 12 realm or public library realm more than you'll hear um, in the higher ed realm. Um, STEM literally has grown roots and stuck <laughs> <laughs> in higher ed. Um, yeah, but it, STEAM isn't, it's, it's a term that, you know, it, it depends on where you are and um, from a standpoint of where you hear it. Um, definitely not as much in higher ed, but as I mentioned, more so K through 12 and public librarianship. Um, okay, um, got a few questions in chat. I don't know if we're gonna have time for all of them. So I will um, start with the first one. What advice would you give someone who has never had a mentor and wishes to have one? Um, and I'm thinking this is within uh, within within the um, STEM librarianship um, um, uh, path. This is where you really have to put your foot forward and put yourself out there. Sometimes it may be harder to ask someone to be a mentor than it would be to start networking. Um, and to ask them, hey, you know, I've looked at your career and do you mind, you know, um, you know, just talking with me about that, you know, for 30 minutes. Um, but opening up that conversation and getting to know the individual, um, because a, a mentorship is two ways. There are sometimes you'll find great mentors. Um, they'll give you good advice, both um, personally as well as professionally. Um, and there are some mentors that you can only go to for a specific thing. Um, but if you've never had a mentor, I'd say just open it up and, you know, do some research about people in the field that you may admire and then reach out to them, send them an email and just ask, hey, do you, you know, is it possible for me to meet with you um, in the COVID area? Hey, do you mind Zooming with me? <laughs> <laughs> Google Meet or, you know, WebEx or Microsoft Teams, either one. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, just putting it out there to meeting with someone one-on-one. -on -one. And if you do find that you develop that connection, then, you know, asking them if they mind being your mentor and say meeting with you once a month or something of that nature, um, whatever works out best for both of you. Okay. Um, what grants can STEM librarians apply for to help ease the cost of programming? I'm going to have to skip that question because we don't do, we haven't done a lot of programming that's in our library. It's still, that's something we need to, that's a growth area for our library. It always has been. And we, and there's not really been any um, big chance of, of STEAM. We did, um, or STEAM, my brain is stuck, STEM. We did do um, kind of a genetic we did an ancestry and DNA project and we got some internal funding. So, you know, if you're at an institution where there is internal funding, sometimes that can be useful, but you know, not every place has that, that's for sure. So I don't know other than kind of your usual places to go. Um, uh, actually, that's a good segue whoop, whoop, because <laughs> <laughs> um, STEM week um, for this year's NCLA conference um, that's one of the programs that we'll be putting forth with regards to you um, is, you know, finding out what STEM grants are out there, you know, looking at what reviewers are looking for, um, and then, you know, pulling in the experience of individuals who've applied to STEM grants. So I will put that plug in there. Um, but um, there are different government grants that are out there. Um, I always mix up the acronym. I forget if it's ISTA or LSTA. Um, that has um, grants, like even within um, NCLA, the Youth Services Division um, is about to pull out a call for grants for individuals who want to put in, put on STEM programming um, to sort of kind of have a kit, you know, with a projector, microphone, um, and other items. Um, 
but sometimes it's a matter of looking at both from a federal level as well as looking at um, you know, organizations like NCLA, ALA, um, ARCL um, to see you know, specifically what STEM grants are available. But just a plug, NCLA, STEM link, we'll be focusing on doing a webinar um, up with a panel um, just discussing STEM grants. And someone just dropped something in the chat. It may be the exact same thing that you event you were mentioning, but it says STEM Link will have a joint grant program with NCLA Youth Services section for 2021 and will award award pandemic programming kits. So there's a tidbit of information um, that STEM Link will be providing. Let's see, we got about five minutes left, so we may be able to get this last question in. I'm trying to squeeze them in there. Um, recruitment is a common discussion topic in librarianship. Have you considered partnering with an LIS program or orientation to discuss possibilities in STEM? Well, I, I can only speak to you with regards to STEM link. I know whenever we have any type of programming, we try to send that information out, um, uh, you know, to um, some of the um, North Carolina librarianship programs, you know, like UNC um, and others. Um, but that's what we do from an organizational perspective. Um, from um, just looking at Wake Forest, I know one of the initiatives that um, we've been looking at is the ride framework. Um, so uh, one of the, the big things that we always do if there's an open position is for individuals to forward um, that open position to any um, listserv that they're a part of, be it their, you know, college or university or things of that nature, um, to try to look at, you know, increasing diversity within the library. So it just depends on what perspective that you're looking at. Um, Terms of from a library or organizational perspective, but those are a few of the things I'm aware of. All right, uh, Krista, you have anything to add? So, well, for our recruitment, we do like what Denise said. What we send out when we're recruiting for librarians, we do send out, try to get everywhere um, that we can that people are related to. But as far as you know, partnering with a program that is offering a master's in library science. And I've had a couple of ideas today. I'm like, oh, we should do this. We should maybe, maybe stem link. Maybe I need to suggest to my colleagues that we create a list of mentors that people can reach out to. Again, lowering that barrier because um, I have to tell you, if I didn't have a mentor, if I had not had a mentor here, I would have been very um, timid. I'm a, believe it or not, like reaching out and cold calling someone or cold emailing anyone. I, that that would have me in 2003 would not have done that. Um, but, you know, because anyway, to get back to the other point with, um, I think there's kind of sometimes a disconnect between people who are hiring and the library programs that exist and, and that there are some of the practicing librarians probably do need to get in there, but it's hard to know how to make those first steps and say, hey, I want to come talk to whoever about what it's like to be a STEM librarian. You know, we get them in panels like this instead of, or if you happen to know someone who's teaching, you might get invited. But it would be nice if there was a more formal way where we could talk about our experiences and the good parts um, and maybe some of the challenges of being, you know, any particular kind of librarian, but definitely a STEM librarian because those are few and far between. But I also think, I think maybe Denise, you mentioned this earlier, we need, we probably need to be talking more to our students who are um, in STEM disciplines themselves coming through undergraduate to let them know, hey, did you know you can do this too? You can, you can do this. Um, this might be something that works for you. Um, and, and try to start at a, a lower um, age of, of letting people know that this is a, this is too, is a STEM profession. So that's some thoughts from up here. All right. Um, I'll, I know that we don't recruit 
um, from different programs, but the closest uh, one that has it, uh, an LIS program is ECU. I know that our department has worked with uh, some um, people in that program who are trying to get their MLIS to do internships. And I believe some of them have done STEM. I haven't worked with them too much, but I know that we're trying to get an internship program started uh, with students from ECU and uh, branching out from there. Okay. Well, I think we're at the, the top of the hour and I would like to thank our illustrious panel, Krista Smith, Denise Lewis, Sean Rutherton. Um, the recording for this uh, webinar and session will be available by the end of the week. I would like to thank for everybody coming out to participate and listen in. Um, I'd like to thank um, STEM Link for uh, collaborating with Remco um, to do a, a joint presentation. This is the first, it won't be the last. Um, I've learned a lot about STEM today. I hope everyone else has. Um, and in conclusion, um, I, I'd once again, just like to thank uh, the panel for taking time out their day to um, provide their knowledge and to share with us today. That's thank great. You. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome.